Starting a company is sort of like pushing Jello, and I don't know how many of you used to eat Jello as a kid. It was a big favorite of mine. Uh, it's uh, a very messy food done improperly. So I'll be talking a bit about that today, and uh, then we'll have a Q and A afterwards. So a little bit about me. Um, as they mentioned, I was at GE at eBay. In my spare time, I invested in about 25 small internet companies, ranging from PayPal and LinkedIn to Evite many years ago, uh, more recent one being Flock. So I've been spending a lot of time both talking with entrepreneurs and trying to be one at the same time. Uh, what I'm not really is a, a serial entrepreneur yet. This is sort of my, my second attempt. Uh, I don't think I'm a terribly great CEO. I'm, I'm a, work in a work in progress. Um, and I haven't been on a ton of boards. Um, what I am is relentlessly self-critical, and a rookie CEO tries to learn every day and is here uh, attempting to share some of those learnings. I do have a lot of experience as an angel investor seeing very, very early stage messy stuff. And I'm someone who's willing to push Jello all day if it helps me get ahead. So that's uh, what I'm here to talk about. And it's interesting, I, I used to tell entrepreneurs, you know, it's all about the team and the traction and getting good funding and all that sort of business school stuff that, that I had learned. Uh, and then I used to wonder when I sat on panels or listened to entrepreneurs, why do they all say you have to love what you, have to, what you do? You have to be incredibly passionate about the product. Like I get really tired of hearing people say that and, and kept wondering, like, why is that so important, right? Isn't everyone sort of passionate about what they do in, in some way? I mean, isn't that not really important to building a company? Isn't that just sort of one of the things you do in whatever it is you do? And what I realized is that most entrepreneurs have this vision of this perfect product they're trying to build. Uh, in this case, a lovely piece of Jell-O uh, dessert from a local restaurant that I picked off of Flickr. So you'll see attribution from the various uh, content creators here as we go. You, know, you have this vision. You know what it, you want it to be. You sit there late at night or after your job or on the weekends or if you're a full-time entrepreneur just trying to start something, you're spending 80 hours a week in your garage trying to make this, and your first attempt usually looks a little more like that. <laughs> it, there's a lot of love that goes into it, there's a lot of passion. It wasn't quite what you wanted it to be. Well, what happened? You know, the first attempt was a mess. You didn't really understand the structure. Frankly, you execute pretty badly. Uh, you show it to your friends, they think you're an idiot. Uh, <laughs> And nobody's going to fund it, right? I mean, let's be serious here. Uh, and even your mom criticizes it, which is always sort of the best barometer that you've failed completely. Um, but welcome to entrepreneurship, right? You've gotten your hands sticky, and you really love this stuff, and you're going to make it work. So you take this demo or this concept, and you go out, you raise a lot of money, and now you're the big jello entrepreneur, you know, out to build the next big thing. You're going to go big, so you, take, you raise a fair amount of money so that you can do some serious jello work here. And the whole team gets pretty messy in the process. <laughs> Finally, you've nailed it. You come up with, since I'm the internet guy, Jell-O 2.0. You've sort of defined your product. It works. In this case, it, it's fairly animated, and people get excited about it. And you feel like you've really nailed the core concept. You have structure. You know where you're going, things are in focus, the investors are happy, people know where to go, everything's great. The problem with nailing Jell-O is it doesn't stay nailed, uh, especially to the ceiling. I really want to find out who put this photo together on Flickr. Um, it never stays nailed. That's one of the problems with Jell-O. It's one of the problems with startups. They rarely stay well-structured for very long. They're always moving, and uh, they're really hard to keep static. So why is it hard, right? You push Jell-O, what happens? Your hands get sticky. The Jell-O doesn't move forward. It moves sideways. People around you start complaining about a lack of momentum, and your friends tell you you're an idiot. So now you get frustrated. You push harder. Instead of your hands getting sticky, your elbows are now sticky. The Jell-O's moving up your arms instead of forward. It's all over the place. The team sees you getting frustrated. They start getting nervous. You know, employees complain to investors. Customers complain to everyone. Pretty soon, I'm throwing Jell-O at my teammates. I'm so pissed off about this. So I've been pushing Jell-O at Wikia for a couple of years and uh, wanted to share a few lessons about it. Uh, it's been a bit of a, a learning by drinking out of a fire hose. We uh, 
create content sites on now almost 6,000 topics ranging from solar cooking to lost the TV show to baby naming, where we now have, I think, every girl's name that starts with the letter D, but no boy's names. So um, it's a bit of an intermittent process. It's messy. And then in our spare time, about a year ago, we launched a search project uh, that's trying to enable two things, both open source search, making all the tools necessary for anyone to start a search engine for under $500, and enabling human input through community contribution. So we've been fairly busy, and you know, with all these different logos and all the projects, it gets pretty messy. And I've learned a couple of things I wanted to pass on. One is you know, vision and passion really does matter. Right? Big ideas make people want to push Jello every day. Everyone in the office frankly, feels like they're pushing Jello every day. Um, you have to come up with an idea that's simple and easy to communicate, and you end up focusing in the early days on hiring zealots, because who else really would push Jello for what we pay? I mean, it's, it's tough work. It's not fun. You get negative feedback from your peers, from your customers, from your mom. Uh, in fact, my mom still hates our homepage, but uh, I'm working on it. And uh, it's painful, right? You get all this negative feedback. You really need to find people who believe in the vision, who are inspired by what you're trying to do. Because if you don't, they're not going to make it. Uh, I've learned a couple of leadership lessons along the way, which is, you know, we sort of came up with this crisp definition of who we're trying to be. You know, and I get tired of repeating it. I figure everybody's tired of listening to me say it. But you realize that you have to say it beyond the point of it being boring, that repetition really does matter. You just keep pushing the jello. You just keep saying, this is what we're doing. This is what we're not doing. This is what we're doing. We're doing it again tomorrow. It's not very sexy, but this is where we're going. Um, and I try to be really upbeat when everything's going wrong, in fact, especially when everything's going wrong, because with all this negative feedback you get in the early days, you know, somebody has to be out there you know, talking about the successes. And so uh, you know, on almost a weekly basis, I'm sending out a note finding something that we succeeded at to trumpet. You know, we just hit a new high. We just launched a new thing. We, we just hired a new person. Like, people need to feel momentum. You know, at GE, we used to call it the drumbeat. You need to hear the drumbeat in the jungle. You need to hear that consistent feeling of momentum and progress. And that sort of helps you get through the day on some of those tougher days. Uh, Winston Churchill, who I've been reading a lot about lately, has this great quote that success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Uh, we fail a lot, and we just pick ourselves up and go on to the next failure. Um, another thing I've learned is that the founder or the CEO is always outselling. So I'm selling employees to join every day, and then I'm selling customers to taste test our Jello. And I'm selling the press that it's actually new Jello and not old Jello, uh, which then allows me to go get investors to pay for more Jello mold so I can go hire more employees, sell more employees to stay motivated, sell more customers in this sort of endless cycle of sort of repetition. Right? I'm out every day selling the Jello, selling the opportunity to push the Jello. That's what we do. Uh, focus is another thing I learned coming out of that. A startup can execute on one thing poorly. God forbid you try to do two. Uh, I talked to a founder of a, of a company. He has seven employees, and he wants to build a business-to-business -business version of his app, a consumer version of the app, and a Facebook version of the app. And I was like, wow, that sounds like three things to do, and I can't even do one very well with 50 people. How are you going to do three well with seven? Uh, so I worry a lot about trying to focus because, frankly, you know, I was at GE. They had 200,000 people. They have been doing business for 100 years. They were pretty good at stuff. We're not very good at much. So you got to focus and be good at one thing. You're going to do a lot of things poorly. Um, at every step, there's 100 things I hear that we should be doing. We should have a dental plan. We should have NDA documents. Uh, I don't know, maybe. But uh, are those critical to our success? No. You know, if we screw them up, does it really matter? No. So I, we, we actually try very hard to encourage error on lots of things that are outside the focus area, you know, and celebrate, some, you know, some of those failures and say, hey, we screwed this up, or we launched badly, or this didn't work. That's okay. You know, and so 
the office on almost a weekly basis, I'm talking about something we suck at, which is fine. Um, you know, we use speed and risk taking, right? And being sloppy is another way to be successful. And uh, so I had, uh, when I was thinking about sort of examples of where I was personally pushing the jello, uh, there was a, a, a website that we were very interested in acquiring about a year ago. And uh, I emailed the founder, didn't hear back. A couple weeks later, emailed him again, didn't hear back. Another email, another email, another email. Around the 12th or 13th email, three months in, I get a note back saying, hey, sorry, been really busy, uh, we should talk. Great. Email him right back. I'm like, let's talk. No response. <laughs> another week later, no response. Another week later, I asked someone else on the team to send him a note. No response. Uh, finally, you know, he pops his head up again. And he's like, all right, you know, I've got some time. How about this week? That was great. Great. Monday, 10 a.m. Let's go. Get in there, start talking to him. And by about 11, I'm like, okay, we should do this. And uh, he goes, well, I'm thinking, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready to sell. And my advisors are saying I should talk to a few other people. And there's some other people that might be interested in buying it. And there's this other startup. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I know that. Uh, I'd like to buy it right now. Uh, which is great because I haven't told my board or uh, <laughs> any of my fellow employees who by noon are now wondering where I am on a Monday morning. Um, and he's like, yeah, I don't really think that's a good idea. And I was like, yep, yeah, but I'm here and I happen to have brought a one-page acquisition document. <laughs> um, what do you think? And he's like, Can I, I'm going to make a couple of calls. Great. So I locked myself in the room. Uh, with him. He made a couple of calls. He comes back. He says, my advisors think you're a bad man. <laughs> uh, that you shouldn't be pressuring me to do this. And I was like, yeah, I, you know, I'm just here. I'm not holding a gun to your head or anything. I'm just saying what price would make you happy and have no regrets. He's like, I don't know. So he goes and calls a few more people. And I'm sitting in the office, coffee's getting cold, but I keep drinking it. And uh, you know, he comes back and he's like, well, I don't know, let's talk about it. And so we talked, and uh, six hours later we signed the docs and uh, went back to the office, and my whole team's like, where were you, dude? It's Monday. And I'm like, oh, I just doubled the size of our company today. Uh, we did. We, we gave him about 1% of our market cap and roughly doubled the size of our company overnight. And it's persistence. We weren't particularly smart. There may have been better people out there uh, who could have paid. There were definitely people who wanted to pay more, but you know, persistence and willing to just grind it out sometimes makes a difference. Um, in fact, it turns out the, the other company was planning to use his company to raise their financing. Uh, so we managed to sort of derail a competitor in the process too, which was kind of fun. Um, we give exploding offers because we hate people shopping the market. Uh, if you want one, see me later. Um, and we take lots of risks with contracts. We don't review most of our contracts with lawyers because they're expensive. We tend to agree to most things big companies want because getting them to change it is too hard. Um, and so where am I now? Right? I, I, frankly, I'm pretty humbled by how hard it's been, even though the wind is at our backs. And you know, we're we're fundamentally gamblers, Jimmy and I, and, and most of the team. Uh, you know, in IKEA, at Wakia, one of the things we've done is we try to tilt the odds in our favor as we place bets every day. So we do lots of things to try to tilt the odds in our favor. We have a big vision, which frankly we think tilts the odds in our favor. People get excited about it. A variety of people do. We have fast growth, and you can see some of the Alexa numbers that is great for selling the media and selling people on why to bother talking to us. Um, we try to define ourselves as a clear leader in our field so that everybody comes to us instead of us having to go to them. Uh, we've done well in the press uh, in now 25 languages, so we try to use that to our advantage. Uh, we intentionally took in too much money from the biggest names we could find in order to use that as a, another point of credibility to try to help us have an unfair advantage. Um, and with both Jimmy and myself, we, you know, you have a couple of folks who, frankly, have no problem going to the roulette table on a regular basis with all our money and 
putting on a random number. Uh, thank you, Microsoft. Um, you know, and we continue to attract zealots. Frankly, past about 20 people, that's pretty hard to believe, but we continue to find people who are just completely bought into what we do and go, oh my God, I want to work here. Like, what do I have to do? Where do I, you know, I'll move here. I don't care what my title is. I just want to be a part of this. Um, you know, and we've got a customer base who's incredibly engaged and very passionate, and yet every day I feel like I'm pushing Jello. Like, why is that? Well, frankly, I feel like I'm pushing Jello uphill sometimes, because on a daily basis, we have major train wrecks, you know, in execution, passengers in the train bleeding, fires burning, negative feedback about our product from everybody, questions from people like, do we even have a business model? Uh, I, I talk to some of our angel investors on a regular basis, and I'm convinced some of them think we're idiots. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about that. Uh, we have an inability to get all the things we want done. We have a lot of angst about who's doing what. We're distracted by new businesses, new features. Search engine came out of nowhere about a year and a half ago. Uh, you know, and we're nervous because we've got lots of competitors, including some that start with the letter P. <laughs> this is a few of the ones I was able to find. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of things to keep you nervous, make you worry, make you derail or lose track or move it or sort of lose focus from going in that single direction. So I really tried to, to think for a minute about how I, I personally stay inspired to do this and to push the jello every day when, frankly, I don't have to, right? I mean, I could hang up my, uh, you know, hang up my entrepreneur boots after eBay and say, you know, hey, I was part of a good one and, and you know, I'd like to retire now and do something else. But I get pretty excited about the vision personally, right? The vision is to be the world's largest sustainable free content, no copyrights, user controlled and trusted media company, right? That's a pretty big idea with a mission of helping people by giving them tools and resources so that they can create and share and discover information on every topic in every language. You know, we're trying to help people who are passionate about things to be empowered to be successful. You know, we believe in transparency, we believe information should be free, we believe in software should be free, and our business model is focused on a couple of, of pieces of goodness that I think are true universally as I've traveled around the world, which is that people are basically good and that working together is more productive, more satisfying, and more fun than working alone. You know, those are the things that we believe in and that frankly are sort of the core to our company. So Jimmy started this little adventure with this little thing called Wikipedia, building the encyclopedia of the world. It's now got over a thousand articles in over a hundred languages. It's a top 20 site in probably 20 or 30 countries now already. And last I heard, number eight in the U.S. This is a, you know, an incredible piece of work that uh, the volunteers at Wikipedia have built. And when he came and asked me to come run this, I said, well, isn't an encyclopedia kind of everything? Like, what's left? And he said, well, you know, an encyclopedia is certainly a big thing, but there's this other thing called a library. There are other books people read that are not an encyclopedia. Let's go build one of those. And so in a lot of ways, we're trying to replicate what Andrew Carnegie did in the last century, which is to build the 21st century library with free information for everyone in every language. And both our content, which some of which feels more like a book and some of which is more news and opinion-y and feels more like a magazine, as well as the search engine, is, is focused on enabling people to find the content they want to better organize the world's content and to make it available for everyone for free. That, I think, is pretty good jello. So I love it. You know, I think that organizing this information into a high quality piece of information that everyone can access has a lot of benefit to consumers. I think this process of collaboration that Jimmy calls the wiki way is really about teaching people to work together and be good to one another. And for those of you who follow bloggers, bloggers are about being confrontational. They're about you know, trying to get an edge on each other. You know, they're broadcasting. The wiki way is, is more about collaborating. And you, know, you see all these studies about the internet and people aren't going out as much, they're staying home, they're becoming less social. Well, the internet we see is incredibly social. It's people 
talking and sharing and collaborating and fighting and arguing, but doing it on a common purpose. Uh, and that notion of a bunch of passionate people who are you know, incredibly engaged in this stuff every day you know, makes me get into work in the morning. And it was funny, a friend of mine a few nights ago at dinner, he asked me, hey, you, know, you were at eBay for a long time, and now you know, you've gone off and you're doing this little startup. You know, what's changed? And I told him, you know, I, I don't know if this makes any sense to you, but I take shorter showers. <laughs> and I got that look that I get a lot. Uh, I says, what do you mean? And I said, you know, when you're in the shower and you're like, I'm just going to go wash my hair again. And I'm going to let the water run down my head for a few more minutes. Because I really don't want to go in and deal with whatever it is I have to deal with today. I, I don't have those moments. You know, it's a blessing. I've worked in two companies now where customers want to hug you. That's another blessing. Right? At eBay, people would come up and tell me they, they changed their life, you know, that we were involved in changing their lives. And at Wikia, I don't think we're there yet, but I've had people come up to me and, you know, want to hug me because they think what we're doing is really important to them. Maybe not to everybody, probably not to everybody, but to them. So that's why I love it, and it's why I'm willing to push the gel every day. So we're hiring. If you want your exploding offer, um, <laughs> Bill and Angie are sitting down in the front row here because uh, we're hiring interns, we're hiring for marketing and all that other good stuff. And uh, that's what I got. I'm, I'm uh, happy to take questions. National sites, are they, do we do the translation? How is it organized? Is the content the same or different? Uh, we're a very open architecture, so people do what they want to do. Uh, we don't translate anything. Uh, in fact, when we roll out software, we ask the volunteers to translate it uh, when we have new functionality. And uh, despite having people who speak about six languages, we're now in 70. So uh, up from probably about 25 when I started two years ago. And what we do is we find somebody who's really passionate about Turkish and wants to do something. We say, okay, great, but we, you know, we can't help. So you, you got to be the guy. You want to be the founder of Wikia Turkey? Uh, so you know, we empower people and we wait for people who are passionate enough to want to do it. Uh, and the jacket. Yes, sir. So if you don't listen to your mom and dad, who do you listen to? About what might be interested <laughs> Uh, if I don't listen to my mom and dad, well, my, my dad suggested I, I follow in his footsteps and be a professor. So uh, fortunately, I didn't follow the, that advice. Um, I listen to customers. Um, you know, I listen to the team who, frankly, is you know out there slogging every day. Uh, we the advantage of having some good angel investors is we get a lot of feedback and market intelligence from them. Uh, and and you know, over the last 10 years, I've had a bit of a pay-it-forward model of trying to help lots of entrepreneurs, and so I get lots of people trying to help now when I'm stuck in the seat. Uh, so we get a lot of help and a lot of input, almost too much sometimes. Um, and I listen a lot to my wife, who you know, has to listen to me bitching about stuff and is usually able to help me figure out what's, uh, what's important and what isn't. But uh, it's not one person. It's... It's criticism from everyone and then trying to figure out what's real. Yes, sir. Um, one of the uh, reasons why Wikipedia is so successful is because it's not, not for profit, right? There's no advertising and so on. What do you see as the challenges in sort of trying to take that model into a for profit company? Sure. Um, no, it's a real problem. There's definitely a segment of users who we will never get. Uh, we also won't get $3 million in free contributions, which is kind of a bummer, bummer but uh, we raise venture money instead. So you make up for it, right? We make up for donations through venture funding. We make up for some of that passion by having passion around other topics. Uh, we've tried to make it more fun than Wikipedia because uh, fun is part of it. I, I had a, a journalist. Uh, it's actually a, a great story. J Jimmy and I were, were talking to a journalist, and he goes, 
yeah, but Wikipedia is like it's a nonprofit, it's educational. I get it. I understand why people contribute to that. Why would anybody contribute to a blood-sucking capitalist like you? And Jimmy looks at him and he goes, "You ever play basketball on the weekend?" The journalist is like, "Yeah." He goes, "Do you know people make millions of dollars to play basketball? Do you feel like the owner of the court is maybe screwing you?" People do things for lots of reasons. Some of it's fun, some of it's passion. If you've ever been to a cocktail party and you happen to get somebody on that subject that they're incredibly passionate about, their dog, their travel, knitting, God only knows what, and then you spend the next 45 minutes trying to get away from them because they won't stop talking about it, you wouldn't have to ask why people will contribute. They just do. Yes, sir. So how do you respond to criticisms from you know, your investor, your mom, your dad? I think you use the term sloppy to describe kind of the culture of American style. How do you respond to criticisms like that? I agree with most of them. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it works for us. Look at the Alexa ratings. There's a combination of look at the numbers. It appears to work. Uh, you know, proof is always in the, in, the, in the numbers. And part of it is, you know, we're focused, right? We're good at a very, very small set of things. And we try to be incredibly poor at a large number of things. And if you're catching something we're poor at, yep, we're poor at it. Like, like I said, I still have people mad at me about the homepage. I got other problems. Uh, so I agree, yeah, homepage is terrible. You should have seen our uh, financing document, the last financing. We listed all the things we were incompetent at. It doesn't leave VCs much to criticize you for when you sort of do it. Uh, it's actually a pretty effective tactic, right? They're like, huh, we don't really have any questions. Uh, so I guess what, I, what I've learned over the last couple of companies is if you're an open company, if you're highly communicative with your users, your customers, embrace the abuse. Because, you know, the last thing I want to have is silence. Silence means apathy and no one cares. Anger is just an emotion. It means they're involved. I'd much rather have somebody angry at me than apathetic. I think we had a couple on this side. Yes, ma'am. How do you, especially in the first kind of 20 or 40 people, how do you make sure that these people are aligned with your values of the company and how do you pick them? Do you do something in the recruitment process to ensure that? I don't think we're quite that good at it. To, you know, we, don't have, we actually don't have any HR people. Um, you know, we talk about where we want to go, and then we erect a bunch of barriers to prevent you from working for us. <laughs> and we wait to see who jumps over the fence. Uh, I mean, most of our employees, you know, heard a version of this story about how many things we're bad at and what we really care about. And those who are willing to, you know, and, and you know, I've had <laughs> interviews with some people where I say most of your day is going to really sink, really going to stink. Like, that's the job, right? We're, we're almost aggressive about sort of filtering out people who are there for the wrong reason because of that. And the other part of it is if, if you really have a mission people believe in, the people who should be there, they find you. They really do. They're either already using the service or they read about you and they drive over. Uh, it gets harder as you get bigger. That's the problem is how do you maintain that as you go from 20 people to 100 to 10,000. That's really, I, that's the, the challenge I worry about. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you mentioned the numbers that seem to work, and I also believe that it's growing steadily, but when we look at internet businesses, and usually the very successful ones have these tipping points that seem to like, suddenly there is a sharp growth of demand. And our, it seems like that hasn't happened at Wikia yet. So are you waiting for that? And interestingly, I, I don't think we ever will. Uh, I benchmark Wikipedia on a lot of different metrics, and I compare it to a lot of other companies that I've followed, where there's sort of this hyper-growth period where they really hit that thing, and it goes crazy, and then it starts to slow down. And you know now the big internet giants are growing 10 and 20 and 30% a year, which is really boring. Um, Wikipedia grew roughly 300% a year every year since inception. We've been doing about the same. Uh, is that annoyingly slow growth to me? Absolutely. I'm 
really, really trying to figure out how to get from 300 to like 900% growth. That would be really nice. Uh, but if we can sustain 300%, it just means that it takes us longer to get there. But there, there appears to be a bit of a natural law to, to, to the growth of this business that I can't fully explain. Yes, sir. With, with so many competitors in the space, how do you differentiate and compete? Uh, we don't. We're not terribly differentiated. Um, and we don't really track all that many of them other than when we raise money. Um, you know, I, you can spend time worrying about competitors, but when you're driving a fast car 200 miles an hour, you can't look in the rearview mirror too much or you'll hit something. So we spend most of our, you know, we know where we're going. If I look at the people I tracked as competitors a year ago, most of them have diverged. Uh, PB Wiki, which is run by a great uh, founder who was a consumer-oriented site, is now a small business site, as best I can tell. Uh, like, we just went different ways. Um, they're going to be incredibly successful. Hopefully, we will, too. Um, but it's focus, right? We stayed focused on what we're good at. And they've, over time, figured out we're better at that than they are, and they focus on other things. So it tends to be sort of a bit of a natural sorting. Yes, sir. Could you speak a little bit about launching the Wikia search, in particular in the light of the media feedback that you got? Sure. So Wikia search and uh, the launch in light of media feedback. So the great thing about the media is half of them got what we were trying to say, and the other half of them didn't and were incredibly abusive. Um, what we're trying to do is build an open source project where all of the software is built by volunteers and all of the content and the ways that the search results are organized is also similarly controlled by volunteers and by the larger community. So what we tried to explain is we're launching the project, the public version of the project to build a search engine. We don't expect it to be good. Frankly, it won't be. It's a project. If you go back and look at Wikipedia seven years ago, if you go back and look at Wikia three years ago, they look terrible. I mean, if you go in the Wayback Machine and look at Wikipedia in 2000, it's ugly and pretty empty and kind of scarily bad. And we tried to get that message across. I think roughly half the media got it. And then the other half of the media went and benchmarked us versus Google, Yahoo, and MSN and said, the results are bad. <laughs> and we said, yes, we told you that. We expect the results to be bad because, frankly, no volunteer wants to work on something good. They want to work on something that they're angry about or upset about or that they think they can contribute to. I'm not sure what I could really do to help Yahoo's search results right now. They're pretty good. I'm not sure I have a ton of expertise at helping them make their search result better. Ours are pretty bad. And there's a lot of people who have since flocked to help. So since the launch, you know, we, we primarily accomplished what, what our objective was, which was uh, we now have in excess of 1,000 developers signed up to the mailing list to help with the software. And in excess of 10,000, I think 15 maybe at the last count, 15,000 people who signed up as contributors and are trying to improve the results and yelling at us that they don't have enough tools to improve the results. And I love negative feedback because it means people are excited and it means they're going to tell me what to build so I don't have to figure it out myself because I'm not that smart. But if I get enough people criticizing me, I can usually figure out where that vein is that needs to go be mined. And so that's really what we're trying to do. We, we, uh, frankly, would have preferred not to get the mainstream press. We were focused on getting the wonky tech press. But you know, with the amount of uh, press interest, we sort of got this tsunami of everybody uh, covering it. The reality is, if you go out on the street in Duluth or Boston or anywhere other than Palo Alto, nobody's heard of it, which is actually the way we'd like to keep it for a while while we make it better. Next. Yes, sir. Uh, being that you were at eBay and you're now at Wikia, eBay was not an open source company, and Wikia is. Uh, as an entrepreneur, how do you launch a company on an open plat platform while keeping it private to minimize the competition in your play? You don't. Uh, you got to figure out which one you want to do, right? I mean, the great thing about open source is it dramatically reduces cost, and you have lots of people helping you make your product better. 
The problem is everyone else can use it too. You got to choose. Uh, you know, we think this Linux style architecture where you can have a much lower cost and sell your product at a lower price, you know, like Red Hat does, is fine, right? Red Hat does a lot lower cost than Microsoft does, but they also have a lot lower revenue. It's just a different model, right? Internet sites like ours have less revenue than newspaper sites, but we don't have to print a lot of paper and kill a lot of trees either. So it's a trade-off. It's not perfect. Um, but we think that engaging the developers, just like engaging the community, has positive feedback for us and for our business, and it's good karma. Yes, sir? You have both paid employees and volunteers. How do you keep it from getting into a class system? I'm not even sure I can tell the difference sometimes between the two. Uh, we, have, we have employees, we have contractors, we have dozens of interns, some of whom are paid and some aren't. I, it, it's personal preference. Some people want to work for a paycheck and are willing to put up with some direction, and other people don't. They tend to self-select. Can you describe the moment when you were recruited to come to the company and you indicated your initial reaction was that it was an encyclopedia? What swung it over and made you excited and made you join the company? What made me join Wakia? Um, so I can even remember it because I, I, I uh, a little bit of a funny story. I was an angel investor in the first round of the company. Uh, a friend of mine called me up and he goes, hey, there's this thing. It's like Wikipedia 2.0, Jimmy Wales. It's going to be huge. I said, great. Send me the investor you know, PowerPoint presentation. He goes, yeah, there isn't one. <laughs> okay, send me the financials. Nah, there isn't one of those either. Uh, you got a one-pager? <laughs> no. Okay, Jimmy Wales, Wikipedia 2.0. I get it. All right. What's the valuation? I don't know, but it's going up. <laughs> this was literally the conversation I was having from my hotel in Warsaw with my friend in Silicon Valley. And he goes, and it's closing soon. So, you know, are you in? You're not in. I said, yeah, I'm in. Uh, and so I, <laughs> not that smart. Um, so I sent him a check. I FedExed him a check from Warsaw. And, uh, a couple months later, you know, I get a note, Jimmy's in town. I was like, well, I should probably find out where all my money went and what the hell this thing is. And uh, so I, I sat down with him over dinner and uh, just sort of asked him a little bit about Wikipedia. And he told me about, you know, what they were building and how passionate people were. And I said, yeah, but, like, how do you pay for this? I mean, I don't see any ads on the site. Like, I don't get it. And he goes, oh, yeah, you know, people donate. And, uh, in fact, this year he was really excited. This was... Uh, God, was this the end of 05, I think? He was really excited because that January, they had made this big decision that for the first time, they were going to send a physical thank you card to anyone who donated over $1,000 to Wikipedia. And I looked at him and I said, people donate $1,000 to a website? Like, seriously? He goes, yeah, it was like, people are really passionate about this. And I said, and it's just like an encyclopedia. Like, I don't get it. So, you know, we, we talked, and he sort of explained to me how the community worked, which was not at all clear to me. Uh, frankly, still to some degree isn't. And, uh, you know, how they built it and how they had become at the time sort of probably a top 50 site uh, with a budget the prior year of about a million dollars. And I looked at him and I said, no, seriously. I mean, a million dollars for, like, server cost, right? And he goes, no, 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 everything. Lawyers, office space accountants, servers, engineers, everything, million dollars. And I had another one of those like moments, and I went, I think eBay spent more than that on coffee <laughs> or toilet paper. I mean, seriously? And he said, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, so it's this great business. It can be very big. It has extraordinarily low cost. Like, that sounds nice. Um, what do you worry about? What keeps you up at night? And he says, well... You know, Wikipedia started with The Hobbit and eventually got to Africa in terms of the content. And what I worry about at Wikia is we're not broad enough in terms of the types of content that we offer. Uh, I said, okay, that's a good one. Any others? He goes, yeah, there's a couple others. You know, Wikia is only in about 25 languages, Wikipedia then in about 70. So, you know, we don't have enough language depth either. 
I went, ah, content category growth. At eBay, we had item category growth. Like, I get that. It goes from Beanie Babies to everything. And language growth is kind of like countries. And it turns out eBay and Google and Wikipedia are all good everywhere. It's a basic human need. These are things everyone wants to do. It taps into this sort of core human behavioral motivation and passion. That makes sense. So more categories, more countries. I actually kind of know how to do that. What's the third one? Uh, and he says, we need to make it easier to read and write. Like, it's still hard to get around the site. It's still hard to contribute. I said, that's funny, because at eBay, we tried to make it easier to buy and sell. And I looked at him and I said, this is a fun problem. And he looks at me and he says, yeah, you want it? <laughs> and uh, so we talked for a couple hours. And I, I drove home. And I still remember you know, driving home. I called up my wife. And I said, honey, I think I've found what I'm going to do for the next 10 years. And I had to call the venture firm where I had an office uh, where I was planning to be a partner and uh, let my mentor know that I uh, had changed plans. And, found something that I thought could be a life's calling. And here I am, two years later. Yes, sir. At Wikia, you clearly had the benefit of big names and investors and everything in terms of attracting the community. You know, how do you do that without those things? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you use whatever advantages you can come up with, and if you can't, you fake them. You try to look bigger. You try to talk to more people. You get more help. You, I mean, God, through, as an angel investor, I've seen this all over the place, right? People have advisors who have kind of said, yeah, fine, I'll be on your paperwork. I don't care, right? Um, they put logos on their website of people, you know. I, I told one small business website that if they have an email address that has a company URL in it, they should say, this company uses our service, because they do. Right? I mean, you, you do your best to look and posture as big as you can with what you got, and you try to leverage that to get bigger. I mean, we, we're no different, right? We're not big. We're not profitable. Every day we're out there trying to, trying to make you think we're better than we are, except today. Because um, <laughs> Linda suggested I be a little more honest than usual. No, uh, but we are. I mean, we're out there trying to, to, to <coughs> sell it. You know, we're peddling a story like anybody else. You know, we, we think our story is pretty good. We got a lot of people excited about it. And uh, you build momentum piece by piece. It's no different. What I find painful, having started my own company without venture funding, is just the accelerated pace is so much more painful. The amount of stuff you have to do so much faster. The, the infrastructure building speed. Uh, is extraordinarily painful. It's much easier if you can go slow and not raise money. It just takes a lot longer. Right? Life's about trade-offs. I don't get everything I want. <coughs> Last question. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about how you've taken you know, maybe more venture funding than you needed, which you know, that was the employee in the talked about you know, the zealots who are going to work for the little amount that you're paying and all the volunteer work. Are you yeah. volunteer? Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, but as an investor, as your, your professional investors, I mean, they're ultimately in it for a return on their investment. Is there any sort of fracture in the culture between those that are doing it because they're just passionate about it, but that maybe don't stand to participate in the upside, and people who will eventually get impatient about their investment? So the question is, is there this, this uh, fissure between those who are passionate and those who are sort of more economically motivated, whether it's the investors or otherwise? Are you mo more worried about the investors or the employees? <laughs> In this case, I think I'd be more worried about the employees. Um, so, I mean, we have an equity culture, right? All employees get equity. Um, even the customer support folks who are in Poland and Chile and frankly won't work for less money for equity because they don't even understand it. Uh, we still give it to them because I think it's important when I have my all hands meeting next week that everyone feel like an owner in the company. Um, and when we go out and try to raise money, we're equally brutally frank with investors and we say, it's going to take a while. And we have a bit of a dual bottom line of trying to do good and be open source while also serving investors' needs and sign up for that or don't. 
Uh, and as a result, I think we've, ex we've, if you look at our investors, uh, they are people who don't have the usual duration horizon issues that you know, a large venture firm does. So most venture firms have a seven-year window. They want their money out. Uh, Bessemer is a 100-year-old firm with one investor. If they make money in eight years or 10, they don't care. Amazon, as best I can tell, doesn't even have a venture fund, but invested anyway. You know, they're certainly not looking at an exit or worried about it. So we, we picked people, both as employees and as investors, who believe in the story we're telling, because we think that helps make the story true. So you pick, you know, you pick your partners, you know, just like you pick uh, who you marry. You, you do the best you can, and you try to muddle through. Well, thanks all. It's great to be here.